Welcome everyone on uh, uh, almost last session today at that data engineering track. And I have a really great pleasure to, as a Airflow committer and PMC member, I have great, great pleasure to introduce uh, Shubham Mehta from, uh, from AWS, from MWAA team, who will be talking about the, uh, who will be demystifying some of the, uh, some of the misconceptions about Airflow. Thanks, Yarek, for introduction. So yes, in this session, I'll be demystifying Apache Airflow and separating some of the facts from fiction. As Yarek already mentioned, I'm senior product manager at AWS, mainly working with the open source team, which contributes to Apache Airflow, as well as responsible for Amazon's managed workflows for Apache Airflow, a managed service for running Apache Airflow. So, well, let's get into what's the motivation for this session. And Actually, before I get into motivation, can I see a show of hands for how many of you have used or are currently using Airflow? Great. So we have some folks who understand Airflow. So let's get into motivation. Let's assume you're trying to buy a product. How many times when you're presented with both positive and negative reviews, you actually focus on positive reviews? Me, I mainly focus on critical feedback, the negative reviews. We generally go for filter the one star and two star rating and see what people are saying there. And be that's because it's our cognitive bias as a human. We believe that negative reviews have more information and they are more, they are more complex. So we should first look into negative feedback in order to understand the product itself. And then we tend, tend to make our decision based on those negative reviews. So in this talk, we'll go over negative feedback that we have seen from our users from, and as well as that we have seen people write about in their blogs and other places and, and un unpack them to understand that whether these negative reviews are actually truthful or they actually are a myth. So as for agenda, I'll be covering around six critical feedback that we hear a lot from our users and I'll share in detailed analysis on each of these feed, each of these critical feedback and try to understand what is the, what is the myth and what is true. And I'll also try to understand and explain what are the underlying challenges because of which this critical feedback came. And then I'll share my personal opinion on what are some of the opportunities that are out there that we can add with which we can address some of this negative feedback. And lastly, I'll leave you with a couple of resources to get started with Airflow. So the number one critical feedback that we hear from users is Airflow is not enterprise grade. We don't hear this in exact words that Airflow is not enterprise ready, but we often hear users complain about the security aspect, about the reliability aspect, and about the, the, the backward com compatibility and the concerns with upgrading of Airflow. In terms of security, users often come to us and tell us that we are in a very highly regulated industry and we can, we are not sure about if Airflow code is actually secure. It's an open source code, but we are not very sure about whether we can run this in our production environment. The second thing that people come and tell us is Airflow, we are not, we are afraid to up upgrade to the newer Airflow version to get the new features because we think that this will break our production environment and the orchestration system is actually very critical for our business. So we cannot have any downtime and we are, we are not really willing to upgrade our production, our Airflow system. And lastly, people often say that Airflow scheduler is not very powerful, it hangs often and it leads to problems and that we cannot rely on it in our, in our production system. So when enterprises are choosing a product, they're not just looking for a good product, they're looking for many capabilities like reliability, availability, security, compliance, and much more. So I looked into three different aspects of Airflow in order to understand whether this critical feedback is actually true or not. And what I found is it's not true at all. So number one, security. How many of you know that Airflow actually formed a security team with very top-notch people who are much more smarter than me, who are actually addressing security issues that are brought up in the Airflow community? And this was formed about six months ago. This team, since the time it has formed, it has been formed, they have clarified what are users' responsibility and what are Airflow projects' responsibility to handle security issues. They have clarified the entire security model. They have clarified the security policy so that 
security researchers as well as the users know where they can actually where they can actually report the security issues and i have seen in my personal experience i reported one of the security issue with airflow and the response from the team was within hours they're very responsive and as can as evident from 25 cves have been addressed in last 12 months itself the team is very responsive and very active in handling all the security issues that have been brought up and if you want to, before the Yerex talk, if you want to get an overview of what is current security policy of Airflow and what is the security model, be sure to scan these QR codes. And this could be applicable if you're running Airflow as well as if you're running some other open source project, you might want to do something similar. The second thing I looked into is extensibility of Airflow. Airflow V2 came out with a lot of improvements. And one of the main improvements there was making all the critical components highly available. You can run multiple schedulers, multiple web servers that make the, these components scalable as well as reliable, and thereby ensuring that your production environment does not have any downtime. Airflow V2 also separated provider packages from the core Airflow. Now the provider packages can have their own release cycle, which ensures that if there is any security issue or bug fix that is there in provider package, that can be rolled out much more independent, much more frequently and independently than core Airflow. And this also ensures that users can actually upgrade to these provider packages without worrying about upgrading their entire Airflow version. And lastly, Airflow also in, also pays a lot of attention on introducing public interfaces for all the critical features. For example, there is a public interface for executor. There is a public interface being worked on for user, manage user management. There is public interface for listeners, operators, notifiers, etc. And what this ensures is that if users want to customize their Airflow environment and introduce any missing capability, they can use this public interface to add those capabilities. And they can also, it also promotes reusability of code and collaboration because once you have made some custom component you can actually share with the with the users for example some i think the aws team right now is working on ecs executor and they have op they are working on open sourcing it so anybody can use that ecs executor to run ecs like is the executor on ecs natively in airflow the last thing that I looked into is how popular Airflow is and what is their what is its adoption like. Do you know Airflow gets 10 million monthly downloads on from PyPy, which which is one of the main like one of the highest ranking PyPy package that I have come across, and almost 40 to 50 percent of the data practitioners are actually using Airflow for their orchestration needs today, as per one of the independent independent research. And household names like Apple, Shopify, Bloomberg have talked about using Airflow in their pro in their production environment, either on their engineering blog or in the Airflow Summit sessions. And enterprises also look for roadmap. They they want to ensure that the project is actually healthy, that the community is actually active and introducing more and more features over time. And as you can see from the right hand side top graph, Airflow community is nothing but inactive. They are constantly introducing features. Over 1600 features have been introduced in the last from 2019, which is about 310 features every year. And earlier, these features were being added in the, in the patch release, but now Airflow community actually strictly follows SEMVAR policy. And that's why you can see that the new features are being added only on the red dots, which means that these features are only added in minor releases or major release. There is no features are being added in the patch releases. Patch releases are mainly for bug fixes. And this ensures that as a user, you can always upgrade to a newer patch freely, which could have security fixes or which could have bug fixes, as well as you can upgrade to minor releases without, with and with the with the promise that your environment will not break because backward com compatibility is ensured with the SEMVAR policy. And as you can see from the graph below, the, the releases have become more and more frequent over time. Nowadays, the Airflow community is releasing new version of Airflow every 30 days. This ensures that 
the the improvements and features are being made available constantly to the community at a at a good pace and it's not just about new features if you look at bug fixes over time the like i was trying to trace the graph of number of bug fixes being addressed and it's like a second degree polynomial so over time the airflow community is addressing more and more bug fixes frequently and as a testament to that is the number of days on average that a bug that a bug report stays open is less than 10 days now which was over 100 days before so the community is very active they they there is a issue triaging team that actually looks up are all the issues that are reported in the airflow and it it gets assigned to somebody within days and gets addressed as soon as possible and gets released within the next if it's a bug fix it gets released within next 30 to 45 days so as you saw the first critical feedback was not true at all let's get into another critical feedback that we hear from our from our users airflow is for batch oriented time driven consistently running pipelines only and we heard we hear this time and time again from our users that airflow they they only think that airflow is meant for batch oriented workflows and airflow started with batch oriented workflows but things have changed a lot let's get into why critics actually mention about time the event driven workflows and what we have seen from users business scenario is that event driven workflows are very critical in to to address the need of data industry nowadays you want to respond to external events you don't want to just run pipelines on a fixed schedule and this is what critics claim is that in airflow today if you want to trigger dags from an external event it's very complex if you want to have inter dag dependency or inter environment dependency it is very difficult to do it but when i looked into this feedback and i started looking all the new features that have been added in airflow recently uh, the feedback the critical feedback is actually untrue there have been a lot of features that have been added recently that actually address the event driven pipeline need from the of the users and with event driven pipelines you want your you want to you want a way to consume your events and the consumers are either typically follow a push based model or a pull based model in a push based system you you are basically building a real time use case where your consumers have to scale with number of producers so if producers are producing more events you have to scale your consumers as well but in pull based system your consumers can actually decide the pace at which you want to consume the events it's much more easy it is less tightly coupled with the producers and that model is actually much more compatible with product like airflow and what anybody who has used airflow must have used sensors in the past and sensors actually follow a pull based model which sensors are basically for use cases like if you are waiting for an s3 file to land and you want to trigger your workflow as soon as the s3 file land you can use the sensor but problem with sensors was you can't run thousands of sensors in parallel so when you are trying to run these workflows at a scale there were issues and sensors were occupying worker slot that made it the made, that made the overall airflow environment less efficient and that's why two important features that i would like to highlight here which address the sensor issue is data driven scheduling and deferable operators data driven scheduling is the new feature that allows you to connect different pipelines via a data set you can have a producer data set da producer pipeline that is producing a data set and then there is a consumer data pipeline that is consuming that data set as soon as the producer has updated the data set which makes it very easy to make your dags depend on each other the second thing is deferable operators deferable operators is based on python async io operation and these run similar operation like sensors but in a in a python async io fashion that allows you to run thousands of these these operations in parallel so if you are waiting for some event to occur externally you can run them as a deferable operator and make sure that your workers are not occupied during that time and you can run thousands of them in parallel and lastly i would like to mention about dynamic dags and dynamic task mapping what this ensures is that you are able to respond to runtime change your pipeline is able to respond to runtime parameters so if you have instead of 10 files in s3 you have 100 files landing 
then you can have you can use dynamic task mapping to ensure that your your DAG actually scales to 100 tasks in parallel rather than 10 tasks in parallel. You can easily respond and to the runtime parameters. And dynamic task mapping, as we have seen in testing, is much more efficient compared to running these tasks, like defining these tasks manually in parallel. The other feedback that we hear from, from users is Airflow UI is not intuitive. People, like you you also must have heard about this from other users, that people compared Airflow with all the new tools that are coming out with fancy, sleek, dark mode as default, and they, they end up thinking that, oh, Airflow UI is not fancy, it's, it's not polished like all the other new UIs that have come out. And to some extent, I agree, Airflow V1 UI, it, it didn't look very aesthetically pleasing, but I have to say that the UI was actually very functional always. You could do. You could look into dependencies. You you had a Gantt chart available to see how much time each task is taking. When it, what is your task lending time? You could look at the logs of the task. You could do all sorts of things. But UI didn't look pretty, and community is hearing this feedback. When I analyze the number of PRs that have been added to improve UI, they have been trending upwards over time. In the past few. Since early 2021, since early 2022, there have been constant flux of UI-related features that have been added. The tree view has been replaced with grid view. There is an audit log view. There is the cluster activity page. And a lot of other features have been systematically added that have not only made Airflow UI more and more functional, but also aesthetically pleasing. And I think these changes are making Airflow UI much more on par with all the other fancy tools that are coming out. To give you an overview, this is what Airflow UI looks like Looks like now. It is functional in the sense that you have the grid view that is always there when you're looking at your workflow, always frozen on the, on the left-hand side so that you can easily go over your different diagrams while on the right-hand side you can change between your dependency view, your code, the Gantt chart, and other things. And this makes Airflow, and you can see, the overall, the elements and everything are much more sleek in design and much more modern. And there is a lot more work being done right now with the community to make the Airflow UI all React-based and make it more modern. So going into another feedback that we hear from the users, Airflow offers limited decentralization. Remember those old school switchboards where an operator had to manually connect multiple calls? That's how Airflow started. It was very centralized and had to be controlled by a single team. But today's data industry is all about decentralization. You want to provide independence to your, to your different data, different users, different data consumers. But decentralizing with Airflow comes with its own set of challenges. The three main challenges that critics often point out is the secure, first is security in multi-tenant environment. When you are running Airflow in a multi-tenant way, it's like an, the Airflow architecture is like an open book. Any task can access the sensitive information from the metadata DB. Secondly, the execution environment is not flexible. Airflow ties you to a single executor and not, does not allow you to specify, customize a different executor for different tasks and tags. And lastly, Airflow does not offer a way to audit your historical DAG historical states. And tags evolve, they change over time, which makes it very necessary for you to see what, were, what was the DAG that you run two months ago, but Airflow does not support it today. However, I have to specify that it's not all doom and gloom. A lot has changed in the past few years, rendering some of this criticism untrue. Let's get into the details. First, the multi-tenancy itself. In the last two years, three AIPs have been written just to support multi-tenancy. It's a big feature. It's going to have incremental approach. So Airflow is doing a lot of work in order to make Air, Airflow community is doing a lot of work to make Airflow multi-tenant. And as you can see in the last, last one and a half year itself, there have been over 50 PRs just to enable multi-tenancy in Airflow. And Yerek is one of the person who is leading the multi-tenancy front. And there was a great talk from Yerek and a couple of other folks from Airflow community that talked about a state of the union of multi-tenancy. It is available on YouTube from Airflow Summit that happened in Toronto a couple of weeks ago. 
but airflow community is not stopping at multi tenancy they are also improving task groups the task group when they started they were a ui feature but now there are core construct that make it very easy to modularize and and make it very easy to make your deck code reusable then the deck versioning yes this was one of the top feature that was requested by users in 2022 user survey and community is hearing feedback there are ongoing discussion to bring forward a new proposal for deck versioning to make deck versioning a reality it's a very hard problem to solve when you have dynamic workflows so because your deck might have changed on run time but community is working towards a proposal that will solve at least some of the problems and lastly hybrid executors community is adding more cloud native executors like i talked about ecs executor and at the same time we are also exploring ways to make the task execution more flexible so that users can define executor at the task and dag level allowing them complete control over the execution environment and there was a great talk again on the executors around air airflow executors past present and future from nico oliveria so you should check it out on youtube that is also available from airflow summit that happened a couple of weeks ago so as you can see there is a lot being done in order to make airflow decentralized so community is working actively to to actually address some of that critical feedback critical feedback 5 airflow is hard to operate at scale running airflow at scale sometimes feel like juggling while you are balancing yourself on on a tight rope and to some extent airflow has been a victim of its own success when airflow started and it was open sourced by airbnb in 2012 as far as i remember nobody saw the number of use cases and the number of users it will end they will it will end up supporting the right now there are companies like apple and shopify running airflow at at a huge scale that nobody foresaw and with with the scaling and running with operating at at scale critics often point out that there are complexities due to overwhelming number of co- configurations as well as the complex deployment architecture of airflow airflow is an open source library and as all of you are here in apache conference you you know when an open source project has to provide at as much flexibility as possible in the same way airflow provides a lot of flexibility to the users but that also means users are left with over 350 plus configurations which is which make it very hard to fine tune the system airflow also has five plus critical components like scheduler web server worker etc which make it very hard in order if you have to deploy your airflow and airflow environment in production you need to configure and manage each of these components independently and it is very easy to break airflow environment the the freedom that dag authors have that you can run any python code as a as a task in airflow is a double edged sword you can write a poor dag that can consume resources from the entire environment and congest the entire environment but again things have changed and i'll share you some of the analysis that i did in order to understand that how airflow has become much more easier to run at a scale first of all a lot of managed services have come out in the past few years there is a managed service from all the top all the top 3 cloud providers and there is a managed service from astronomer as well which which take an opinionated approach over the configuration and make it very easy to run airflow at a scale at the same time airflow community provides your docker image which has everything baked into it and the configurations are by default selected in the right ma- in the for the right way at the right level so that you can run that docker image as it is in production with minor changes and as we talked about airflow v2 actually introduced a lot of improvements making airflow much more reliable and fault tolerant by introducing higher availability uh, uh, higher availability for all the critical components secondly in terms of uh, adaptability we talked about dynamic task mapping and deferable operators they have made it very easy to run thousands of tasks in parallel which was not possible earlier with sensors and lastly we don't need to stop there and this is what i also talked with airflow community at the airflow summit as well 
there is an opportunity here for us to come together and to provide something like contextual config guidance so that we can expose the configurations at the right touch points in the UI and in the documentation. Imagine you getting a notification in your Airflow UI that your scheduler is overloaded. You might want to increase the scheduler heartbeat check threshold, which will be so much helpful in order to understand, okay, I need to address this Airflow step, the scheduler stability. And secondly, we are all who are using Airflow, we are writing DAGs, and we know that writing DAGs is, can be a complex task especially if you want to write performant DAGs. There is an opportunity here to, to create an open source tool that can actually identify the, in, the problems in DAG the, whenever it is not following best practices and highlight those to the user with recommendation. Nowadays, there are LLMs which are, which are providing pre-built code for everything. I'm sure this is an easily solvable problem. And if you are looking to solve some of these problems, I would love to talk to you. Like we have a team at AWS also working on open source and we would love to collaborate with you to solve some of these problems. And we can also work with the Airflow community to solve some of these problems in open source. The last critical feedback that we hear from users, Airflow is not always developer friendly. This is a heavy one because imagine you're trying to do a deadlift without proper training it can actually lead to a lot more injuries. At the same time, when you start with the airflow, while it is very, very powerful, it is very intimidating. There is a lot of things going on in airflow and it can be very overwhelming to understand all, all of that. Let's get into what critiques specifically point out with developer experience. When I talk about developer experience, I'm talking about the entire user journey from, from writing the workflow code to deploying it in production and then monitoring it in production. And Airflow makes it very easy to start with DAG authoring because it's a Python code. If you know how to write Python code, you can write your first DAG within minutes. But if you want to write a DAG that can actually run at a scale in production in, a, in an optimized manner, you need to know a lot of concepts. Like I talked about deferable operators, dynamic task mapping and all that. So while Airflow is very powerful, it is, it can feel like you need almost a PhD in order to write a good DAG. And then once you have written a good DAG and workflow, it's very easy to test it locally. There is Breeze environment that is available which with you can deploy or run Airflow locally very easily. There is There are local runners available from all the managed services. There is Docker image that you can run locally. It makes it very easy to test workflows locally. But if you want to take them from your local testing environment to production, you need to again set up some CI CD pipelines. And as users have pointed out all in a, in a user survey, 42% of them mentioned that CI CD is one of the least discussed topic in Airflow contents. So you need to understand how to set up those GitHub actions, how to create your plugins, how to, how to manage your DAG storage in order to actually create a proper CI CD pipeline. And lastly, once you have deployed the things in production, it is very hard to hard to monitor them because Airflow, again, it's an open source project. It provides a lot of flexibility. So it comes with over 70 plus metrics, which can be hard to monitor. But once again, this community is actually aware of some of this feedback. And as recent as version 2.7, cluster activity dashboard was added to Airflow, which makes it very easy to monitor your pipelines across your entire Airflow environment. And community, I'm sure we are going to continue working to improve cluster activity dashboard to make it more and more better. The way I'm thinking about it, I feel like cluster activity dashboard should be the place where users go to whenever they run into any issue and they can find out, okay, what's the action I need to take. The second thing is DAG authoring. With DAG authoring became easier with, with the Taskflow API, if any of you are familiar with, with it. It, it introduced Python decorators that make overall DAG, DAG code much more clean and much more easy to read. But there is an opportunity here for all of us to come together to build an open source utility that combines the code-based and the UI-based DAG authoring approach. And as one of the user survey pointed out, 40% of the users express preference for a hybrid approach that combines UI and code. And lastly, 
CI CD recipes and plugins. We I have seen a lot of other open source projects have actually solved this problem by providing one click deployment recipes and pre built plugins for CI CD. And Airflow community can come together to build some of these. Again, if you're interested in working in some of these items, feel free to connect with me and I would love to chat with you how we can bring some of these proposals forward with the community. So, to sum it up, we went over six common criticisms that we hear about Airflow. We analyze each of them to understand what was the myth and what was actually the truth. And as we found out, there was a lot of misconception out there. And yes, Airflow is a is a software, and like any other software, it has some some gaps. But all these gaps are an opportunities that the Airflow community can come together. All of us can come together to address. The community today has twenty six hundred GitHub contributors, and this was data taken over. I think a couple of months ago, I'm sure there are more now. And it has about 34,000 Slack members with over 100,000 Airflow users. It's a very big community. In terms of number of contributors, it is the biggest, largest Apache, Airflow, Apache project. So all these gaps in the software are the opportunities that we can easily address. And if you are someone who is just getting started with Airflow, my only request to you is, not to rely on blogs and articles written a couple of years ago or even a year ago because at the pace the community is innovating, these things become outdated very quickly. So if you want to learn about Airflow, you should get the information right from the source. And the source is, you should go to the ecosystem page of Airflow to see what's out there in the Airflow ecosystem. It will also lead you to the documentation page. And if you, are inter if you run into any issues or if you want to just discuss about some proposal that you have or just hang out with fellow Airflow builders, feel free to join the Airflow Sec community. There are a lot of people like Yerek, me and other folks who are very active in the Slack community and will respond to you within within hours, if, if not minutes. That's all I had in this talk. And any questions that you folks have? So the question is, are you aware of mainframe control M kind of job job orchestration systems, control M, autosys, et cetera? And are we planning to have all those capabilities in Airflow? So yes, I like for example, like some of the capabilities with calendar, there is actually a proposal in, in draft which is trying to add some of those easy to like that make it very easy to define a schedule in Airflow. So yes, Airflow community, I'm seeing a lot of customers, they are coming from Control M and Autosys and adopting Airflow. And they are bringing in their own proposals as well as communities aware of those, those requests. And if you have some specific feature that you are interested in, you should definitely start a mailing list thread. There are a lot of builders out there who are interested in building these things. And Airflow actually added calendar forecasting that is there that has been there in Control M. So you can actually go to calendar view and see when your pipelines will run in the future. And with timetables, it's easy to define custom schedules, but it's still, timetables is hard to figure out. That's why there is a proposal going on. I think it's AIP 50. I'll, yeah, I'll, I think AIP 50, but I could be off by one or two, which is actually making the overall, simplifying the scheduling in Airflow. Uzi, yes, there is actually a tool out there from from Google that converts UC workflows to Airflow. On top of that, the one of the AWS team actually built similar tool because when you are migrating UC workflow, it depends on what cloud you will end up using for for your processing. For and the Google uh, tool uses Dataproc for for the data transformation and processing and the uh, Amazon solution, it, which is also out there, it uses EMR for data processing and transformation. So yes, there is an investment there happening. And there has been actually discussion how to migrate the control M jobs, but they're more difficult. So, but it's a good discussion to have how we can make some of this migration more easier. I'm personally most excited about multi-tenancy and it could be a bias because I'm also to some extent involved in that. But I feel like multi-tenancy is actually rethinking about every concept in Airflow. 
and how you would have when you have multiple teams multiple tenants running on the same sharing same environment how do you make sure that there is security and each of these tenants are not interfering with each other there is no noisy neighbor problem so it's a very wide scope and the community is actually doing a lot of work in order to address that so that's the thing that i'm most excited about yes that's why multi tenancy is actually under the umbrella the aip one that year i had started improving security in in airflow it is actually under that umbrella and the features that have been done in order to enable multi tenancy like supporting internal api and deck processor separation it is are done with the premise that when we have these tenants we have to make sure that all these tenants are independent of each other and they are not able to interfere with each other so there is a lot more work going on in order to and that's why multi tenancy is taking more time it's very easy to divide in at the ui level different teams but you, we are trying to ensure that there is security from the database layer itself i think we can wrap it up here thanks so much for attending the talk